Hello once again, and uh, greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. This morning I want to uh, read a couple of passages, but I'll read uh, from Daniel uh, chapter 4, verses 28 to 30. And it reads as follows, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence, and for the glory of my majesty. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, you, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And so if you read on, you'll find that uh, God uh, punishes him and puts him in the wilderness, um, removes him from his throne for a while until he subjects himself and realizes who God is in his life. And The preceding chapters uh, to this chapter or these verses highlights a, a king of arrogance, if you would like, um, someone who, who seemed to choose to re remember what he wanted to uh, in respect of his uh, kingdom, um, where he was as a person and how things had come about. Um, he tended to ignore um, Daniel's um, participation, if you would like, under godly presence and godly guidance and godly power and authority in the interpretation of dreams. The rescue of uh, Daniel and his friends from the fiery furnace and, and how Nebuchadnezzar um, praised God, the God of Daniel, that he is the God of all gods, etc. Um, and so we find... Nebuchadnezzar uh, being arrogant, uh, presumptuous uh, about how great he is and who he is. In fact, to the point that he, you know, selectively um, picks what he likes and dislikes in life. And so often um, life is about what we want to see or hear. Um, it's about what uplifts me what confirms my thoughts. Um, and I just, if I was to think of this in a matter of um, how to put it into context or uh, put it into perspective for each of us, because it needs to become personal. Um, it's so easy to read it in the Bible and see it just as a story uh, and not never to make something personal. And so often we, our lives are a reflection of or what, around, what is around us is a reflection of how we think um, and what we choose in life. Much like our gardens, like you know, I'm a gardener. I enjoy gardening. I enjoy gardening flowers and shrubs and trees and I do veggie gardening and, and I enjoy that. It's a, a, it's, a, it's a hobby of mine that I love. But my garden will represent those things that I choose to plant in it. Those two things that I choose um, for my pleasure, for my enjoyment. Um, and, and so often that is with everything we have in life. Our pets that we have, whether they're nice and cuddly and controllable, uh, or they're big and ugly and ferocious if you want and not so controllable, uh, um, they are reflections of who we are and what we're about. Um, we attract to us. We, we have things around us that represent our character and pleasures, if you would like. And have you ever thought about what is God's pleasure for you? Um, what is, where has God positioned you? Um, are you happy or not? Uh, a question maybe is, have you repositioned yourself out of the position that God wanted you in? And have you ever thought that what God blessed you with is not uh, for your pleasure, or your like, or dislike, but because he had a plan and a purpose, a will for you? I mean, if you think of Daniel, do you think his first choice would have been uh, serving in a foreign palace, serving a foreign king, uh, being subjected to foreign laws, uh, foreign rituals and religions? And uh, I mean, 
I'm sure it would have eaten at him, but he, he had a, a way to remain, which we'll have a look at that a little bit later. And I just thinking about these selections in life and how we surround ourselves, I wonder, are our spiritual selections uh, along the same line? What do we choose to see? Um, do we choose what we, uh, what we want to be seen? That's from our lives, the perspective of what public sees, what other people see, uh, where we, we hide thoughts and actions and desires, and, uh, and yet God sees all of them. And when we look at the, the book of Daniel, so often we, we find the book is used as a means to portray heroes who seemingly never put a foot wrong. Um, and yes, Daniel and his friends are a, a true and bright example to us. Um, but, you know, we tend to focus on the, the public aspect of their characters, um, the example shown in public, and, and we sort of praise that and highlight that, and, and we use that as an example. And yet, the example is not actually, it shouldn't be the public Display Yes, we understand that we need to see this publicly. We need to see faith externally. We need to uh, see faith in action. But it's not the, the end product that should be the example to us. But it is rather, I believe, um, where it's developed from. And when I'm saying that, I'm not saying that to be good is not a good example. To be faithful is not a good example. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, what I'm saying is when you are faithful, that comes from somewhere. When you are good, and, and the Bible reminds us that no one is good, only God. So when you are good, it's, it comes from somewhere. When you display uh, integrity and, and, and uh, truth and conviction and, and, and these things, they come from somewhere. The external uh, form of that, Sometimes it's a, it's a dressing bias. It's, it's as we say, we put on masks and we have masks of faith and we have masks of love and we have masks, masks of goodness. But I'm talking about when God sees that goodness, when we look at Daniel's life and we see things that Daniel and his friends have done through faith, that is built from something far deeper. So that action comes from somewhere far deeper. And, and that's really the truth of life, is because uh, character will be tested in hard times. And when you have character built deeply in you, uh, that character remains no matter what. It's like joy. Um, if you have joy, joy, deep joy, joy from the Lord, it doesn't leave you, no matter what times you go through. You see, circumstance doesn't change your character. That's the thing we have to understand. Circumstances will change, but God never changes. So when whatever you have, whether it be faith, whether it be discipline, whether whatever, integrity, honesty, when it's built in the depths uh, from God and the Word of God and through the Spirit of God, no matter what circumstances change or how they change or, or what circumstance you are in, won't change you. Because if you if you uh, rooted in God, and that means in his word, through his spirit, uh, through a good understanding of who he is, that means no matter what comes your way, you don't change. Yes, there will be little fragmented changes in you, but deep down you remain the same. And this is something that we see in Daniel and his friends. And what we notice from Daniel's life is that he didn't try and just survive in a foreign land as a captive, but he led a life of character one of submission, one of personal commitment, uh, which showed up deeply, in, in, as I was saying, in, in his public character. When, when he was out in public, these things came out in abundance. Why? Because he, that was what his life was about. And if we were to examine some of those things of his character that made up the strong character of his, I mean, let us just have a look. There's a, a six things that we could look at, and I'm sure there's more that you could go and find. But I mean, his diet, he didn't uh, submit to a diet where food was offered to, um, and sacrificed to idols and things uh, through the palace and that. But he chose to eat a food that would glorify God. He chose and trusted God that the food he ate would sustain him. 
and he wasn't prepared to compromise even on the little on on his diet. He wasn't even prepared to say, "Well, you know what? I'm in a foreign land. Let me do as the foreigners do." No, he lived. He committed himself to the way he had to live, and his diet remained the same. Let look at his motives. Whenever something happened, whether he interpreted a dream or he came through the fire or, or whatever, or the lions or or whatever happened in Daniel's life, he exalted God. He never took credit for any of his actions or the results thereof, and his motive was therefore then to glorify God. And if I was to ask you this morning, who takes the glory in your life? A third factor we look at is his convictions. He remained, it didn't matter how he was promoted or elevated in the kingdom. It didn't matter what glory came to him, whether he was clothed in, in royal robes or, and given authority and, and money and power. It doesn't matter how he rose through the ranks or popularity. He remained committed to those around him. And that's quite a, a difficult thing when you when you are gaining momentum and suddenly you sort of leave your friends or leave things behind and you and and so um, your convictions change. His remained the same. He remained the same. And and these are things that we need to understand and learn that as Christians, when God begins to use us or, or do things through us, remain committed to those who are close to you. The fourth thing we look at is his honesty. He spoke the truth no matter the consequence. He told the king. It didn't matter if he understood, well, this dream, this dream uh, king is going to put you in the wilderness. This dream is, a, is, a, a, is God speaking out against you. And I am now the spokesperson for God. And it didn't matter. He spoke. And, and if you were to read that, um, the verses before he, he proclaimed, the king had to say to him, don't let the dream trouble you. Tell me the meaning of it. Because Daniel was troubled by it. And so he was, but he remained honest. And and one of the, the, the two last things or, or two things that are of great importance, and, and that is firstly is of discipline. That he disciplined his life in a life of prayer. And this is how his character was built. The discipline, discipline of prayer. And his choice was, I pray no matter the consequence. The same as his honesty, he spoke the truth no matter the consequence. And here, the decree was, you won't worship or you won't pray to any other God. Daniel's, listen, this is the number of times I pray, and I pray consistently in this manner, therefore I will continue. Why? Because my discipline to my faith, to my God, because I need this. It wasn't a matter of he did it out of a form. He did it out of, like many of us, we go to church, or many of us, uh, we say our nightly prayers because we feel we need to. But he prayed in such a manner. Why? Because he needed God for what God was doing in his life. That, that was the basis, the founding factor here is that Daniel understood he wasn't like the king. He wasn't like Nebuchadnezzar who had arrogance and felt a self-sufficiency uh, and thought that, well, he doesn't need anything. Why? Because look at what's happened in his life. Look what's going on. Look at these things that are happening. Let me show you. Look what God is doing. I don't need to be disciplined. I don't need to. But Daniel had a totally opposite um, perspective on life. The more time he spent on his knees, the more God did in his life, not only for him, but for others. And that was the, the key, because although da Daniel stayed faithful and disciplined in diet, motives, conviction, honesty, and prayer, it was all for God's glory, not for his own, in everything he did. And the last point I want to just make is that uh, his integrity um, he had no interest in worldly temptations. Nothing could buy him. Nothing could change him. Especially that which would compromise all the, the, the five um, thoughts that I, I brought before you. Anything to, to enact or to change those things, to hamper his motives or his diet or his convictions or his honesty and his discipline. And th those things, nobody could buy them. You couldn't offer Daniel anything. And I think that these six points 
are, are so important for us in the building of character in our lives. And, and we must remember that when we do these in our quiet time, when no one is looking or we think no one is looking and we remain true to these aspects of life, then our public life will be like that of Daniel's. And the thing is that Daniel is not a book, I don't believe. Daniel will be the last person to be want to be portrayed as a hero. Daniel, I believe, would, ra- would rather be uh, wanting to be portrayed as a person who is submissive and subjective and disciplined, uh, someone who glorified God in everything he did. And, and I believe that would be the thing, not, not the hero factor, not the factor that, oh, wow, Daniel is so great. No, the fact is, where did his character come from? Where did his personal, um, where did this uh, public character uh, that we all read about and people saw come from? And it's from far deeper and greater acts, and that is of submission and subjection. And I wonder, uh, when Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, and he wrote, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. And remember, looking at the will of God, he says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of the foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And I wonder, when Peter wrote this, was he thinking of Daniel? Did he think back and say, Yo, you know what? Daniel was such an example of someone who, who submitted, someone who did the will of God. And, and in doing the will of God, he, he put uh, to, uh, to silence the, the ignorance of foolish people. He put to silence the critic. He, he silenced those people who who thought otherwise, who thought of themselves as greater than they were, who were arrogant. And I just wonder, was he thinking of Daniel when he wrote this? And I wonder if um, James was considering the life of Daniel when he wrote in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And in his actions of submission to God, He ignored everything else because who would want to put him in the fire? Only the devil. Only only the enemy would want to reduce you to ash so that you could no longer glorify God. And, And I think many times we forget the fact that we are here to do God's will and the will to glorify him and in doing his will to be sanctified and in his will becoming saved and in his will spending time on our knees because that is the aspect of it. And did Paul consider Daniel when he wrote in in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I mean, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. Charles Spurgeon wrote that when joy and prayer are married together, their firstborn is thanksgiving. In other words, when, when we are rejoicing, when we rejoice in who we are in Christ, when we rejoice, when we have a deep-founded joy of who God is in our lives, and we, with prayer, that means supplication. I don't mean, I don't mean just uh, prayers thrown and tossed up in the air, but I mean a genuine prayer like Daniel did, seeking the face of God and the will of God. And when they are married together, their firstborn is thanksgiving. And I just wonder sometimes, are we self-sufficient in the way we think and the way we act? Nebuchadnezzar ignored everything of God. And I, I, I wonder if it's not something like where, say we were walking through a, a field, a, a wild and unplanted field, a field that it, just the things of creation grew in them. 
And we walk through that field and there's different grasses and trees and shrubs and bushes and, and flowers. And, and how many of those things would we ignore for the greater? How many of those things, when we'd look through this uh, felt and this bush and as we walked, we'd see beautiful things. We'd say, oh, that's beautiful. Ignoring all of God's creation around us. In, in fact, to the point of where we could only see certain things and the rest of God's creation is imperfect, if you would like. It's not as beautiful as those things I see and choose. And how would we liken that to the way Nebuchadnezzar was in his arrogance, where he could only see those things that he wanted to see? It's because he never had a life of prayer. And when I speak about a life of prayer, because the, the uh, we read in Thessalonians that it is God's will. This is God's will that we pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstance. When we don't have a deep relationship with God, we are very selective on what is good and what is bad in life. And it's only when we look through the eyes of God do we see the true beauty of nature, of everything around us. I mean, even then the fly and the mosquito become something of beauty. Even the unruly neighbor, the rude colleague, the the unthankful boss, through the eyes of God, are seen differently. Time brings perspective. And when I say time brings perspective, I don't mean time lived in years, but I mean time spent on our knees before the Lord brings a different perspective into our lives. May I ask you, are you worried about what is to come? Are you worried about what is happening in this world? Then pray. I don't mean a quick prayer. I mean, like Daniel, discipline yourself that you might find the will of God. Not praying because it's a command that this is the will of God, but praying because this is God's will and you are free to do so. You are free to enjoy the presence of the Lord in your time of prayer. Let us remember that character is spent is something built from much time spent on your knees. I pray that you have a blessed day in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.